And of course, every Friday, I don't have to tell you this. This is this is uh, into the this is implanted, imprinted into the DNA of this show. An opportunity. It's a tradition, really, is what it is. Thanks to our friends at Local Environmental Services for you, the listener, the viewer, the audience member, to get something off your chest. We call it trash talk. All right, a warning, like for real, a warning on this one. If you're watching this, uh, we're about to show you something that's troubling to see. This was submitted to us from Mel. Uh, it's not for young eyes. It, it, we're going to show you, well, what happens when poachers run rampant. Uh, Mel says, yeah, I was, uh, I was scrolling through my Facebook, and I, and I follow the Alberta Fish and Wildlife account, and they posted this uh, out of White Court, and it destroyed me, she says. Turns out a poacher took down a healthy... 450 pound grizzly bear prompting this post from Alberta Fish and Wildlife Enforcement it was a week ago, uh, no rather two weeks ago on Friday October 14th around 4 o'clock, somebody shot this bear and just left it on a logging road about 7k north of Blue Ridge near White Court Now, witnesses say that this driver, they were behind the wheel of a pickup truck. It was a Dodge with a quad in the back, a blue pickup with a quad in the back. They're looking for this person. The vehicle drove up to the bear and then peeled off in the other direction. Mel says, now, I'm sure that there could be a few explanations for this, just a straight-up poacher, maybe somebody just killing for fun. Perhaps somebody mistook it for a black bear and then fled when they realized that they'd done something illegal. But I'm calling on the driver of this pickup truck, the person who pulled the trigger, to do the right thing. And says Mel, Real Talkers, if you know who this is in that blue Dodge with the red quad in the back two weeks ago that shot a grizzly and left it dead, turn them in! That from Mel. What about this one from Lauren, who says, uh, I have strong, strong objections uh, to journalist, uh, former journalist Tom Vernon's statement on Real Talk this week that I don't think that there's anybody in Edmonton really unhappy about the new arena. Lauren says, I live 17 blocks due east of the old arena, and I can assure you that my neighbors and friends who live in Montrose and Boyle McCauley and downtown are very unhappy with the impact on our neighborhoods, our quality of life, and our property values. I invite you all to ride transit with me to work one day. See what I see, a tour of the other side, says Lauren. And I'm so disappointed, by the way, on a different front that Barry Morishita just can't win against Danielle Smith and Brooks Medicine Hat, partly because of the NDP. This is a repeat of the Highlands Norwood election in the late 90s when the NDP insisted on running against a stellar liberal candidate. And guess what? The Conservatives won. Gary Masick. I'm sure Dave Cornwallier, the blogger, would remember this. The Alberta Party, unfortunately, not a thing. Too bad, Barry. That from Lauren. Yeah, I too think the NDP should refrain from running a candidate in that by-election, but everybody thinks it's the Alberta Party that should fall on the sword. We can debate this another day, Lauren. Thanks for that. Janelle says, please don't say my name as I'm a provincial public service employee. Okay, Janelle, not her real name. She says, please shine a light on the massive taxpayer dollar waste of this monstrous shuffle in the United Conservative Party. The Premier's acting like she's got the next election in the bag. She's completely dismantled everything, which if she was elected, we would expect, but she was not elected. And we have an election coming in seven months. And if she doesn't win, you can bet your ass that Rachel Notley won- will undo all of this damage as she should. But what people are not paying attention to is when cabinet shuffles to this magnitude, when 45% of the Alberta public service is affected, it costs taxpayer dollars to move staff to different buildings, to align their teams, to hire ministers, to run these brand new ministries. It costs dollars to redo letterhead, to redo envelopes, and the list goes on. Now, I would understand if she was elected to be premier for the next four years, but at this point, it might just be seven months. And again, if Rachel Notley wins, she says, I need people to freaking understand what it's like to be a public service employee in times like these. And as a side note, Jason Kenney should know this. He could have dropped the writ. He could have let Albertans decide rather than 3% of the population, but no, he values party over country. I mean, Janelle, most politicians would, but I digress. She says, I understand why he didn't. Many implications, but these are unprecedented times. She says, listen, my brain is tired from the worst reorg ever, the mass confusion, the non-communication. We've just been sitting here trying to guess what what ministry we're part of right now is our staff directory doesn't even match the HR site. It's a gong show, says Janelle. And now I digress because I'm just disgusted and pissed off. Please shine the light like I know you can. Well, Janelle, 
You just did. And this one to close. It's a letter to the Titan of Talk. This is a letter from Ken Uh-oh. to Charles Adler. And he says, I see that a lot of people are very upset over the myriad of climate protesters around the world throwing various liquids on art, homes, offices, and other properties. He's talking about Van Gogh. He's talking about Monet. Uh-oh. He says, now, Charles Adler was on your show reacting to these protests. And I believe that he vilified them, or at the least stapled the epithet of directionless, mischievous youth onto them. Now, here's a thought experiment for Mr. Adler. If your neighborhood was sitting on a gas line that was about to explode, but your fellow community members were apathetic about it, or worse, paid into services that would expedite that gas line exploding because they didn't know or didn't care, would you not do everything in your power to get their attention? Uh, But what if they ignored you? What if they influenced the media to paint you as a fear monger, as a loon that needed help, as a youth that listens to too many radical lectures. What would you do, says Ken? Mr. Adler, many who are raising awareness about climate change are largely doing so in non-violent, non-destructive ways. Those paintings are sealed and protected against such attacks. Now, that doesn't make the protesters non-responsible, and it doesn't mean they shouldn't face criminal charges. But here's the thing. Chemistry, physics, fundamental ruling mechanics of the universe simply don't care because they can't care. IR, you know, radiation will continue to be absorbed by CO2 molecules no matter what we do. The richest human, the most vocal hawk, the most charismatic bad faith grifters can buy, pitch, sell, lie, denounce, preach all they want about how climate change isn't real. But the universe doesn't care, Charles. The universe doesn't care because it can't care. It is incapable of caring. I highly suggest you read Kim Stanley's Robinson's The Ministry for the Future. What happens when the positive feedback loops start ramping up? What happens to the people who are going to be most affected by the destruction and death that is coming? And how are they changed? Even if you don't like hard cli-fi. What is that? Climate fiction? Cli-fi? I've never heard that. I love Love that. I've never heard of that before. (laughs) Ken says, I challenge you to read the first chapter. By far the most depressing and disturbing entry I've ever read in a novel. Charles says Ken. Things are bad right now, but they're going to get worse very, very, very quickly. And Mm -hmm. soon, even the most ardent climate change deniers will be wishing they had listened to the message these villainous youth were trying to promote. That from Ken. I'm not throwing that. I'm not throwing it away. Now we've got two potential emails of the month. It'll be Jillian versus Ken. We'll announce it on Monday. I don't want to make this decision. We might have to do, you want to do it? We might have to do a Real Talk (laughs) poll, an official unscientific Twitter poll to see who wins the Real Talk email of the month. Hey, Ken, thanks for that. And guess what? We're going to give Chuck a chance to respond when the Titan of Talk, the Emmy Award winner, the Lifetime Achievement Award winner, Charles Adler, joins us on Monday. It's a Real Talk edition you will not want to miss. 